Our next speaker, Ian Williams, is a native of, native of Liverpool, England, and has been the Washington Report's UN correspondent since 1991. So it's no surprise that he really knows the ins and outs of that world body. He has twice served as president of the UN Correspondents Association and has won, won many awards for his exposés of UN malfeasance. At the same time, he has supported and defended the UN and its ideals and has personally known four secretaries general, as well as numerous international diplomats and officials. Ian has been a columnist for The Nation and The Guardian American Online and an editor for the World Policy Journal. A senior analyst for Foreign Policy in Focus, he is the author of The UN for Beginners and the recently published Untold, The Real Story of the United Nations in Peace and War. And he and Dr. Tilly will be signing their books during the break that follows this panel. Please join me in welcoming Ian Williams. Um, it'd be difficult to follow Virginia's detailed academic <laughs> expose, uh, but it's worth remembering, you know, one of the big problems with the United Nations is people, what's it good for? And you know, I'm very diffident about this. I tell people it's the worst possible organization except all the alternatives. <laughs> and it does work that way. If you start off with a sense of um, realism about what the United Nations can do, what it stands for, then you don't get disappointed too easily, and you welcome its small successes. And there are successes, and they're very relevant here. And there's a very good reason why Israel and its lobby concentrate so much on the United Nations. Uh, as you, the, the, what, what Kofi Annan called the un, unique legitimizing power of the United Nations, we've seen several results of this recently. And Israel can never get clear title of Jerusalem or the occupied territories without a UN say-so. That's key. And it's actually been proven since 1945. If you think of the occupations, East Timor, everyone had given up on East Timor. The Indonesians, I actually told the foreign minister over lunch one day, you'll never get clear title, <laughs> ever, until you can get the UN to do it, and the UN won't. So they fought it to a standstill in there, but in the end, East Timor is independent. Only this week, and I don't know whether you saw this, the European Court of, of Justice actually ruled that the European Union had no right to sign fishing treaties with Morocco that included Western Saharan fisheries. In effect, the European Court was legitimizing boycotts <laughs> of, 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 uh, of produce from occupied territories. I think that one is something that should be played up a lot more yeah, because uh, it's a, I know it's a contentious subject, but we've pointed out several times in Washington Report that there's a separation wall in Western Sahara as well as in Palestine, uh, that there are many parallels there. Um, the other one, of course, is uh, West, Western Sahara will, in fact, sometime, even you never see a map where it's included in Morocco. The, the, the Moroccans cannot get clear title. And it's the same with the occupied territories and Jerusalem. And this brings us back to the ambivalence of Israel and the lobby. They have, I mean, how should I put this? It, it's almost psychological, psychoanalysis. They have a deep respect for law. But in a sort of the Talmudic way that makes the elevator stop on every floor in the Sabbath so they can still take the elevator and obey the letter. The <laughs> Israel spends a lot of time trying to work its way around the laws. It very rarely completely denies them. So at the United Nations, they, spend, they and the U.S. spend a lot of time trying to create the sort of Sabbath elevator <laughs> so that they can skirt within the law. And, but they are very scared of actual definitions of the law. That's why they are so upset. If the U.N. were ineffectual, they wouldn't devote so much effort to thwarting resolutions in there. And... Take Virginia's object, there is an apartheid convention. And it's like the genocide convention. There is a legal, international, binding commitment on member states to do something about an apartheid state. If Israel is declared to be an apartheid state, or be practicing apartheid, there are legal consequences that states have to follow. In another, another regard, if you remember Jim Baker in Bosnia, and the State Department were very, very solicitous to make sure the word genocide never appeared. You know, mass murder was fine. 
Mass murder is something that you can ignore. Genocide has a binding legal commitment under the Genocide Convention. You have to do something about it. So, you know, it looks like we're playing with words, but this is very, very serious. And the Israelis know that. For a start, they deny it, but in effect, Israel is the only state that was actually created by a UN resolution. So you have the conundrum that they have been busily denying the efficacy of the United Nations, its legitimacy, saying that the resolutions don't apply. But their very existence depends on a resolution. You hear continually a theme that General Assembly resolutions aren't binding. And we could say, amen, because it was a General Assembly resolution that partitioned Palestine and set up the Israeli state. So... <laughs> You can see you could have a whole joint conclave of Jesuits and Talmud scholars to work your way out of this uh, particular fine print, you know, where you're denying the basis for your own existence. <laughs> and it does have international complications because the United States was a founding member of the United Nations. It's still an indispensable part of the United Nations. It's inconceivable that the United Nations would exist without the United States taking part in it. And this creates severe problems because there's always the Israeli exception. Almost every law that comes, every, every resolution that comes up is being weighed in the balance. N nuclear non-proliferation, we saw with Grant's presentation earlier. The United States is signatory to non-proliferation treaties that say that no country apart from the, 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 the five, what is now the five uh, permanent members should have nuclear weapons. And then it condones nuclear weapons in Israel. And because it does that, every other country in the world, India, Pakistan, North Korea, say, hey, if them, why not us? You're continually creating exceptions to your own rules that other people walk in through. You know, the, 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 the settlements in particular, the US has never actually approved them, but they've changed the language so often over the years that it's, uh, it's that, 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 as far as the US is concerned, Jerusalem is international territory, the State Department. I believe, uh, just showing this punctiliousness about law, uh, I think I read earlier this year that the State Department is still refusing to issue passports with Jerusalem, Israel, to Americans born there. It's still Jerusalem. They won't put Israel on there. So the State Department does have some residual respect for international law that's missing from the White House <laughs> completely. <coughs> So let's get these territories together, because the UN is like... <laughs> the, the, the UN is a sort of cockpit for all of these things. All human life is there. You're watching it. And you have this ambivalent attitude. Is Most American Jews, as we know, are liberal globalists. They support democracy and freedom. They like the United Nations. They made an exception because of all this stuff about Israel and Zionism as racism. They didn't think it through, but you know, it, it, it eroded the support. And this helped erode the support for the United Nations inside the US. You got the, so the, the, the people who would automatically have been natural supporters of the UN were always ambivalent about it. You have Jewish senators from New York looking over their shoulders who will pass resolutions condemning the UN, cutting the funds. And that's one of the points that the lobby has been doing in Washington, is to try to trim the UN to size by threatening to withhold funds, or actually withholding funds, or pulling out of organizations, as we've seen recently. And the effect of this isn't just financial. Uh, it is a continual sort of attrition of the morale and standing in the UN. We've seen secretary generals now who realize that to get on with the US, you have to pander to the Israel lobby. And all secretary generals have done this, to some extent, in a pragmatic political way. Kofi Annan was possibly the most um, accommodating up till then. Ban Ki-moon had a continual stream of the Jewish lobby organizations, B'nai B'rith, Conference of Presidents. They were coming into his office all of the time. He always received them. They were banging on the door. They were also in the UN, and they were banging on the doors of embassies. All of these funny swing states that you sort of, the micro states that only stamp collectors know about usually, <laughs> will come up to support the US and Israel 
on these crucial resolutions. You know, the, the, the two, three, six, the Pacific Trust Territories, a few others, they, they come there. And this is a result of intensive lobbying by the Israel lobby here on these states to affect Israel, Israeli policy. At the moment, we have a particular situation coming, which is, uh, which is it would be almost laughable, except it's so serious. Uh, I don't know whether you know, but Israel is actually running for a seat on the Security Council this, this year. And, you know, on the face of it, this is laughable, but we have to remember that Morocco was on the Security Council while occupying Western Sahara. Indonesia was on the Security Council while it was occupying East Timor. Uh, Rwanda was on the Security Council while it was massacring its own population. You know, so it, it's not totally unprecedented. But usually they, they didn't actually say they're defying the whole gamut of international law openly. And is this likely to happen? Um, I don't know, I don't want to get too much into it, but they're running for seat in the West European and other group, <laughs> which is an imperial uh, sort of hangover because essentially it is Europe plus the white Commonwealth, <laughs> Australia, New Zealand and Canada, plus the US as a sort of ancillary member. And the Asians wouldn't have them, the Africans wouldn't have them. So in the end, intense lobbying by the lobby through the US, came in and badgered the Europeans into accepting Israel as a sort of associate member so it could run for offices, which run on a, rotati rot rot a rotatory basis. So Israel became a vice president of the General Assembly, became chairman of obscure committees. Uh, would you believe the Israeli ambassador, I think, is chairman of the legal subcommittee at the moment? Which is, uh, well, <laughs> it's, like put, you know, it's like putting Casanova in charge of the, the chastity committee. <laughs> does not compute. <laughs> but this Israeli ambassador is actually very, very concerned about uh, this, this, this bid. Then this was upgraded very quietly so that Israel became a full member. So it was allowed to run for this. It, it could run for the Security Council. And the, mechanic, the mechanics of this is, regrettably, I mean, it's good for Western Europe, but most of the countries, the Security Council seats rotate on a Buggins turn basis. You know, they have calendars going decades ahead sometimes of who occupies what position at the UN, which is why you get genocides in the Human Rights Committee, and now you might get, you might get Israel on the Security Council. And the reason for that is West Europe is the only one that actually has elections. And if they don't decide within their own group, then it goes to a general poll of all the members to who becomes a temporary member of the Security Council. So... At Germany and Belgium are the current candidates, and Israel is running against them. And I've been trying to sort of calculate the odds on this. It's difficult. Um, you know, the, I can imagine there are Israeli ambassador, the Israeli diplomats going into Berlin and saying, you owe us so much. Why don't you do the right thing? <laughs> Why don't you stand down and let us run? How could you deny us? Do you want to compound your crimes? And the generals will say, well, we'll give you another submarine. Shut up. <laughs> We're taking this one, I suspect. But I am worried about Belgium. Um, you know, the other people will gang up on Belgium and say, you should stand down and do the right thing. Because that's the only way to get in. If it goes to an open poll, Israel isn't going to get it. But if it's done with a stitch-up like this, if Belgium is leaned upon sufficiently by the other powers, it might just do it. So it, it's worth watching and it's worth... Uh, intervening. What's the practical effect? A lot. You know, discussions in the Security Council, they do end up crucial, the resolutions that come through. Uh, even a temporary member in there can have considerable effect. You know, while, while France was grandstanding over the Iraq war, it was the other smaller countries with the respect for international law, like Jamaica and Ireland and, and, and others like that, who actually provided the bulk of the opposition to the Iraq war in there and stood their ground. Where do we get to with this ambassador? And I think this is where it brings the lobby in as well. Because the UN is so unpopular in some parts of America, like the evangelical Christians, or um, with the diehard Zionists, it's a great fundraising gamut. I keep getting letters from various organizations saying, poor little Israel, 
the only country not allowed to be on the Security Council. Poor little Israel, continually victimized at the United Nations, send a check. <laughs> And I think it's one of the dynamics, I think Grant touched on it before, is these organizations are businesses. They're self-sustaining businesses, so they want checks off people. And if they can find an issue at the United Nations, they can raise money on the strength of it, and they do. But then it has a practical effect, because secretary generals, UN staff get pilloried, they get uh, harassed to do the right thing. And we've seen that with the reports that have been squashed. You know, they, they just get, they'll just get dropped, or, or they'll be sidelined. I mean, look what happened to poor Arthur Goldstone. <laughs> now, he's, he was personally harried into the ground um, until he gave up. Uh, you know, I, I felt he was almost a tragic figure by the end, because uh, he started off with such integrity. But with the US, it's even worse, because it destroys the whole basis of the United Nations. The embassy move is in direct defiance of the UN Charter. The US, the founder and drafter of the UN Charter. Um, you, you, when, when the UN Charter was flown from San Francisco to Washington, the case had its own parachute. Uh, Al Jahis, who was carrying the case, didn't have a parachute. I think they, maybe they knew something that, or suspected something. But I mean, that was how seriously the US took the UN at the time. And this is setting at naught international law. I mean, it's been defied, but this, this is the significance of it. Donald Trump has basically ripped up the UN Charter. And then it getting, because we're talking about people who can believe three impossible things before breakfast, like the Red Queen in Alice, they are now saying, ah, but Iran is in defiance of UN resolutions. Therefore, we must take action against it. Because that's the other fulcrum at the moment. The case for a war against Iran is being made in the United Nations. The, the, our, our current uh, ambassador, Nikki Haley there, is, I mean, she, she should get her credentials from Tel Aviv. I was going to, not Jerusalem. <laughs> because I, I've never heard her say anything that isn't 150% in support of Israel. She really is. I mean, she's devoted her full time there, and she gets there and pledges in. It gets down to the actual reason why the lobby is so important for these people. You want power in Washington, it goes through the lobby. You want to be president in the United States, as the US ambassador to the UN most assuredly does, you go through the lobby. They will jump through any hoops at all to do it. And that risks they risk the organization, which for all its faults, um, you know, it's, it's, a very, it's a major but pragmatic inclusion you may look at the UN and say it's a failure, but as people in there will tell you, we haven't had World War III yet. And that's the, yes, that's the measure. But this is the road to World War III. If you dissolve the whole structure of international global law and security, that's, that's, that, that's where we're going. And that's what Donald Trump has started, and he's done it on behalf of the lobby in there. He's done it because... All across this country, people are writing checks to congressmen, persuading them to vote in defiance of international law and to vote to revile the United Nations. There are refugees who will be going very, very hungry all across the Middle East soon because Donald Trump has defunded UNRWA, which, by the way, has been doing the Israelis a favor. They've been very ambivalent. They like to revile it to keep it off, its off, off balance. But you have to remember that UNRWA has been doing what Israel should have been doing as the occupying power. UNRWA has been paying for the health and education of occupied Palestinians when the occupying power should have been doing it under the Geneva Convention. So the Israelis have known this all along, and they've reviled and shouted about UNRWA, but only so far. I, don't think, I think they are privately probably appalled <laughs> that Trump has actually followed through on their bluff and cut the funding. No, no, we didn't mean it, Mr. President. We want the money, honestly. <laughs> we just want to keep them under control. Uh, so they have kept them under control to a large extent. They've kept Secretary General after Secretary General under control to some extent. But it still comes back to it. Ban Ki-moon had all of these people from all of the Israeli organizations coming in. But he always, once he'd been to Gaza and saw what was happening in Gaza, that was the key. The Israelis tried to stop him going to Gaza. Um, as soon as he got there, you see all of his statements, he stated very clearly the UN positions about occupation, about Gaza. And 
So yes, he kept receiving them, but then he would tell them, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to break the siege. You cannot keep on doing this. You've got to end the occupation. And Guterres is in the same position. He's instinctively pro-Israelis, like a lot of European social democrats. But he is now telling them, gently, <laughs> you've got to. But the terrible thing is, as long as the US is 100% behind Israel, and as long as the lobby keeps it that way, then the UN is never going to be a functioning international body uh, in, in, in a complete way, which is, is bad news for the world, all of us, on every level. You know, whether it's climate change or whatever. It's, it is an indispensable organization. And I see I've entered the red light district now. So <laughs> I'd better wind up. I always stay in the red light district if I can. But I'll go and sit down. Thank you very much.